Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to everyone for joining us today from across the country and around the world. I'm Queenie Potus, Partner Success Manager at Conscious Capitalism, Inc. And on behalf of the entire CCI team, we appreciate you taking the time to learn and grow in community with us. Conscious Capitalism, Inc. is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing the movement by creating learning opportunities like today's session and building systems of support for practicing conscious capitalists through interactive programming in our senior leader network, engagement in our local regions through our chapters, and in-person events to further connect, like our CEO Summit, for example. As many of you know, conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of business, as well as a movement of business leaders from around the world working to change the practice and perception of capitalism as a means to elevate humanity. Several times a month, we offer virtual gatherings as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and the business practices of those in our network. Today, we are excited to welcome Tembi Machaba, Senior Vice President of Human Resources at Fresh Pet, and Heather Whaling, CEO of Gebbin Communication. Tembi will be in conversation with Heather to share her knowledge in leading a radically human organization, approaches to managing the distinct needs of diverse workplaces, and supporting and maintaining a values-driven culture, especially given today's ever-changing climate. The session will run for about 45 minutes. Tembi and Heather will be in conversation for about 25 of those minutes and then transition to the audience for questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes. Please feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will try to get as many of your, to as many of your questions as we can during our time together. If you're having any technical issues, please email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org and one of our team members will be there to assist. This session is also being recorded and will be available on our website under the events page. Now I am honored to introduce Tembi Machaba and Heather Whaling. There they, here's, here's Tembi. Perfect. Hi. Hey, Heather. Hello. How are you guys doing today? We Very great. good. Doing great. Awesome. Well, it is a pleasure to have you both join us today on this topic of conversation. Um, for our audience, as mentioned, Tembi is a senior vice president of human resources at Fresh Pet, a company that strives to do what is right for pets, planet, and sorry, for pets, people, and the planet. If you don't know Fresh Pet, you can walk down the aisle, the pet aisles of your grocery store, and you will find a unique fridge that houses uh, pet food made with fresh and real ingredients. Tembi has an impressive track record for of more than 18 years of hands-on experience in organizational design and development, as well as strategy, performance management, team growth and planning, and talent management. Prior to joining Fresh Pet, she was a Vice President of Global Human Resources and Organization Effectiveness at Molson Coors Beverage Company, a position she held for three years as part of a 16-year career of her progressive roles at the company and its predecessors. Her primary focus in this role was partnering with business leaders to ensure a strong talent bench, uh, provide direction on performance and management, and build a values-driven culture. She has a degree in social science from the University of Natal in South Africa. I've had the pleasure of bringing my Siberian Husky Henry to the Fresh Pet offices where it was heaven for him and meet Tembi to learn about her personal story and the initiatives she has and is undergoing with the Fresh Pet leadership team. And here we also have Heather Willing, a CEO of Gebbin Communication and is a member of the Senior Leader Network at CCI. Heather is a CEO, board member and investor on a mission to positively impact her community through intentional actions, a giving mindset and rewriting the rules when necessary. At Geben, which is German for to give, Heather is built a 35 person agency known for their fast pace and tangible results. Named to the Forbes inaugural list of America's top agencies, Gebbin acquired an agency specializing in social impact in 2021 to deepen the firm's commitment and expertise to helping brands do good. As a board member and investor, Heather applies her entrepreneurial mindset to mission-driven organizations, infusing bigger, bolder uh, ideas and spark impact. 
deeply committed to economic self-sufficiency for women, Heather serves on the board of the Women's Fund of Central Ohio and was appointed by the mayor to the Columbus Women's Commission, which works on public policy through a gender lens. Um, I'm going to stop talking there. That was a, a mouthful, but really, really excited to have you guys here. So thank you for, both for being here today. Excited for this conversation. And I'll hand it over to, to you both now. Thanks, Lee. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. We're so glad to have you here. And Tammy, I'm so excited for us to get to spend the next you know, 25 minutes or so in conversation. Yes. Um, so I know we got your sort of the official bio, but let's just set the table a little bit, share a little bit more about your background and how your past experiences have influenced your approach to working with teams and creating policies that are very like people focused. Yeah, no, well, thank you for having me, first of all. And it's awesome, awesome to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, obviously from the introduction, everybody knows that I'm from South Africa. I grew up in South Africa. Um, my parents are South African. I'm married to a South African man. Um, and we have certainly been on a journey, um, you know, bouncing between a number of different countries, but obviously more recently here in the United States. Um, my career has taken me from big corporate uh, in different parts of the world, um, but more recently, obviously, here to Fresh Pet. Um, and my background is predominantly in human resources. I mean, I've kind of bounced between your kind of generalist roles, looking after functions, and then also in OD, which I guess is really my sweet spot, um, strategy, organizational development and design, and then also culture, which is really, I think, what today's topic is about. And uh, that's certainly a passion of mine. Um, a little bit more closer to home, um, you know, obviously growing up in South Africa with our very colorful background and history, I think so much of what we're dealing with today as a society, I think I felt um, growing up in that community. I mean, I had parents that were embedded in the community. Um, my dad is a theologian by profession. By profession. Um, he is now retired, but he was also very heavily involved in politics. And so it was very much about engaging in the community, being part of South Africa's background culture. Um, and at the time when I was growing up, I mean, everything relating to kind of apartheid and kind of moving into a more democratic society, I, I certainly felt and experienced it and it certainly shaped how I see the world and how I take on my responsibilities in HR. Um, and then my mother was an academic as well. She was a principal, a teacher, um, and also was very passionate about providing underprivileged communities in South Africa and certainly children, the opportunity to think big and to think outside of the box and not be you know, defined by the, the tiny little world that they're in because there was so much more to, I think, what was possible. Um, and certainly in the 90s and into the 2000s, I think my choice of company has certainly been shaped by an organization's ability to get involved in community. So fast mm -hmm. forward to today, where I am with Freshbed, having spent a lot of time in the beer industry, which I love. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but I have taken, I guess, a lot of that with me. And certainly when I think about policies, my approach is exactly what my parents told me, grassroots, you kind of start from the bottom up, listen to what employees are saying, help them also understand what it is that they need um, if they aren't able to mm -hmm. articulate it, and then make sure that it finds itself or finds its way into policies that are certainly gonna help bring out the best in them and certainly drive growth for an organization. Um, yeah. so, so that's really what I've been focusing on for the, the last yeah. few years. Oh my gosh, that's such a helpful overview to really level set for the conversation. Let's talk a little bit about Fresh Pet specifically and the yeah. values that Fresh Pet embodies. And then how do you sort of operationalize that or bring those to life then from a human resources standpoint? Yeah. I mean, I think one the, the one thing that made me fall in love with Fresh Pit was that it is such a mission purpose driven organization. I mean, we know what our North Star is. It's to nourish pets, people and the planet. Queenie said it earlier. And it comes to life in so many different places. I mean, from when we kind of screen for candidates, when we try to hire and bring people in. Um, our founder always says to me as you know, the, the head of HR, find people that bleed green. 
and green being the color that symbolizes obviously prosperity but also freshness that it really is something that we kind of hold dear and close to us um, but from that from that north star of nourishing pets people and planet we have five values um, and they certainly do show up in everything that we do from how we kind of shape our, our policies to how we reward and recognize employees and also just in terms of how we operate as a business. And I'll quickly go through them. So the first one is operate from a place of truth. Um, it's a very simple uh, value. In short, it's no BS. <laughs> you know, you come into work, you speak your mind, you are encouraged to say what's on your mind, um, even if it's the less popular thing to say. It's a very flat organization. We encourage accessibility. We want employees to feel that they can not just approach HR, but our CEO as well. Um, and we also have a group of employees that are kind of a cross section of the business. We call them the people team. And what they do is they try and kind of garner feedback from our employee base and make sure that whatever we have baked into policies, procedures, you name it, it reflects what people have asked us to do or their expectation of a company. Um, so that's the first one. The second value is do the right thing, which I think it says it speaks volumes. And in, in that is the concept of, you know, making decisions with a strong moral compass. And I can share a couple of stories of how we've kind of brought that to life. But I think for us, it shows up in one, our obsession with safety. We're a manufacturing environment, certainly here in Bethlehem. Um, it's cold, it's long hours, but employees come first, and we certainly make sure that that's known, you know, to the, the employee base. And the second is our obsession with quality. We have a quality product, we're putting it out there to our, our consumers and our, our, our pets, and we want to make sure that it is safe and it certainly is nourishing, um, you, you know, uh, the, the, the public in, in general. The third one is passion and tenacity, and that de definitely fuels our growth. Um, and we reward that and it comes up and it shows up in our reward and recognition. Um, we actually call this facility, so I'm based in our manufacturing facility in Bethlehem, and we call it the kitchen. Um, and it is, it's a kitchen, we're making products and we call our employees chefs and they're in there and they're fixing up the ingredients and, you know, testing stuff out and making sure that we get the best quality products out there. And that for me talks to being passionate about the work that you do and passionate about our mission. Um, the fourth one is remaining innovative and entrepreneurial. Obviously, as you get bigger, you know, you're obviously adding more perspectives in. And we have been very deliberate in trying to recruit for a diverse employee base, because with diversity, obviously, comes creativity and the ability to problem solve um, with speed. And then the last one, um, which is, a, I think, a value that really resonates with everybody, which is make sure everybody wins. And that for me, and I think for so many folks is, you know, go for it, but not at the expense of others. We're all in this together. We're all gonna hold hands and jump. We don't always know what's happening outside or beyond the borders, but to the extent that we are kind of in it together, that has to show up in how we operate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are the five values. And, you know, we, we try our best to make sure that it kind of is, is present and alive. Yeah, well, and that last one, the um, make sure it works for everyone, yeah. that is interesting, especially as we think about this time that we're in now, and as we sort of, I don't know, are we coming out of COVID or entering this next phase of COVID, and, um, you know, thinking about, there's been so much conversation over the last year or so about offices and hybrid work and returning to offices, and is there value in making everyone come back? Has that ship sailed and people just get to work from wherever? Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you're navigating that at Fresh Pit? And I'm especially interested in how this idea of like, how do you make that work for everyone when it's such a big decision? Yeah. Um, and, and any tips or advice that you have for, for business leaders who are trying to navigate this, this tricky conversation? Ooh, yeah, Heather. <laughs> that's a tricky one. I mean, I think um, like so many companies out there, I think we kind of are trying to learn as we go. And I think there is a recognition that this um, idea of having all the answers at one go, I think to some degree is a bit of fa fallacy, right? You're kind of waiting to see how other companies are doing it. You're taking the best ideas, the best solutions and seeing whether it resonates with employees. Um, and we've gone slow to go fast. I will say that. I also want to layer in the fact that we have multiple locations and that in itself 
also sets the tone for how you think about this return to work. And so let me kind of lay it out for you. As I said, I'm here in the Bethlehem facility. It's a manufacturing facility. We have another one in Ennis. This is a 24 seven operation. And during the pandemic, we shut down for a week, maybe a week and a half, obviously because you know everything shut down. But once we were able to get back up and running again, we were back at it. And the employees were here showing up to work every single day. And the same can be said for the office staff, the support staff that are here based in the kitchens every single day. We're in it together. We're all going to hold hands and jump. You know, this is a team based environment. That's Bethlehem. We also have a corporate office that's based in New Jersey. And there we have a lot of our um, commercial teams, our finance teams, IT, HR are all spaced out there. Again, every, everything shut down at the beginning of the pandemic. But what we said to them was, you know, let's take some time, let's think about how we get back into the office and let's do what's right and what feels right. So now you have these two different kind of communities, the one that's kind of in it, they're going, and this other group that are kind of working remote. And how do you get them to feel like they're all together, going back to the first principle of make sure everybody wins, we're all in it together, it's hold hands and jump, and yet you have different operating um, standards and practices. So what we try to do and what we are and we always try to do is kind of put it back to the employees. You know, there's this kind of shifting narrative about the power of the employee and how that's obviously changed over time and we're feeling it. And so we sent out a survey. Uh, we asked folks, tell us what works for you as far as you can. Obviously, if you're in an operational role, you've got to show up, you've got to be here. But certainly for the folks that are here in, in the office is what makes sense for you. And most of them said, value the time with, with colleagues, want to get back into the office, also recognize the changing physical as well as psychological contract with employers. And so mm -hmm. let's go with the hybrid, but let's see how that evolves over time. So that's where we're kind of at, Heather. Uh, I mean, I don't think we've got the silver bullet. I don't think we've got the answer, but what we have mm -hmm. said to employees is that you own this decision. We will meet you where you are. We will acknowledge that you've also got, you know, the world has changed, you've got specific needs, um, and we'll work with you to, to make sure that it's kind of a win-win solution for both the company and the employee. Yeah, I think that's so important, especially right now, like, it's such a hard labor market for companies that are trying to hire and policy yeah. decisions like that do have a big impact on, you know, is someone going to stay or do they want to go? And how do you navigate those pieces? And you know, you don't want to make a policy decision that all of a sudden is going to create this like mass exodus when it's hard enough to hire as it is. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been a lot written about the the labor shortage and the um, just how hard it is to fill certain positions. How is that? Is it is Fresh Pet feeling the impact of that? And what any, you know, kind of interesting or unique or innovative ideas that you all have tried and had good success with to help find qualified employees and bring them into the company? Yeah, I mean, we definitely felt it. And it's kind of ebbed and flowed. I mean, we're certainly very conscious of the other players in certainly the Lehigh Valley. I mean, this is obviously, again, a manufacturing space. Um, there are a lot of warehouses that are moving into the Lehigh Valley. And so the war for talent is real. Um, and we felt it. I guess at its peak in the middle of last year in 2021, mm -hmm. when we were still in the pandemic, there was still this nervous, you know, nervousness to get back out into the to the workspace. And we were seeing a lot of employees leave as well. And so our ability to kind of keep the lines going and make sure that our operations are stable and make sure that we are holding true to our safety standards, because as you're introducing new employees, of course, there's the training component that comes with that. So, I mean, we did everything, you know, not too dissimilar from what other companies did, right? You kind of become a lot more aggressive in terms of your position in the market as an employer of choice. Um, you ramp up your recruitment efforts. You start to think about wages and benefits. But what we also did, Heather, is to kind of go back to, again, the voice of the employee and grassroots, right? What are people telling us they want, what they need? What if people said, who have left the company um, in terms of what we couldn't provide then. And is it time for us to kind of go back to basics and relook at our benefits and how we've kind of structured some of our offerings. Um, and we did a, a, an engagement survey at the end of 2020. Um, so again, it was smack in the middle of the pandemic. 
And there were a couple of themes that kind of bubbled to the surface. The first was this desire for career development. And that was across all levels, um, salaried and hourly employees. The second was a, a, a request to just continue to keep this environment safe. Um, I mean, we did everything we could during the pandemic to make sure that, you know, we had the kind of social distancing protocol, we had the quarantining requirements, you name it, we, we pulled that on board. But there was another element, which was, I'm still coming into this environment, I'm still going home to my family. There is that added risk that I am now exposing my loved ones, you know, on the way to work and leaving work. So how can you help me with that? So there was that kind of theme of safety. Um, there was also the theme around, you know, wages in general because of all the competitions. So how do you outcompete in terms of, of compensation? And then the last was hours of work. And again, here in this environment here, we work 12 hour shifts, right? Our teams are kind of six to six. It's not the most glamorous environment. It's cold, it's refrigerated. Um, and so to be able to compete with other employers in this area, you've really got to have a compelling value proposition. So I guess the starting point was, is it compelling? Are we pulling in people? Are they really thinking about us as like their final destination? This is their home away from home. Um, and if not, why? And to be creative around how we structured work schedules. And I'll give you an example. We noticed when we kind of dived into the engagement survey that a lot of the women that were working here in the plant had said to us, you know, the shift schedule makes a big difference. The physicalness or the physical nature of the job is one thing, but the actual shift schedule doesn't work for me. I am expected to come in six to six. I have kids, many of them are single parents. I want to be home for my kids, especially now that they're working or they're kind of working remote and taking classes from home. And I want to be there for them when they go back to school. Is there a way that we can configure the shifts or make it possible for them um, to be there for their kids when they either leave for school or when they wake up in the morning? And what we found is that more women want to actually work the night shift, which is six to six. Um, oh, interesting. Because it allowed them to be there when their kids woke up in the morning, they would leave, leave the work environment, get home, the kids would be waking up, could get them ready for school. Or if they go to school, the mom then sleeps, <laughs> gets some rest. They're still there when the kid comes back from school, can get them set up for the evening routine, homework, dinner, you name it, dad's home as well from work. And then off they go and come to Fresh Pet and obviously are able to kind of start, start their day here. So it was a little bit of a different dynamic, right? We'd never really, we always think about people wanting to work day shifts, but for mm -hmm. that specific group, there was a very specific request and we were able to kind of accommodate that. And then of course, you know, and I, I, I'll kind of pause there, but the concept of wages and career development, we made some significant changes to the academy for a lot of our hourly employees that was layered with wealth creation. Um, and what I mean by that is equity, right? So it's one thing to offer an entry wage rate. It's one thing to try and keep up with the market. We obviously have very competitive benefits as well, but what we wanted to do was kind of distinguish ourselves truly as an employer of choice. And that came in the concept of ownership. So we give every employee um, stock and they get it on an annual basis. Um, and they can earn incremental equity as they progress in their career and as they acquire more skills. And that's kind of baked into what we call the Fresh Pet Academy, which is basically a, a training program for our operational teams. So mm -hmm. it was trying to take very specific challenges and I guess differentiate ourselves a little bit within the, the environment that, we've, um, that we're operating in. I, it's so interesting. A couple of different times you've talked about the sort of the voice of the employee and going to them and asking for their feedback and input. And I think your example about the some of these women and the moms, especially wanting to work the night shift, is such a good example of you know a bunch of leaders sitting in a conference room probably never would have come up with that idea or solution on their That's own. Fun. We mm -hmm. do something here at Gavin. We do something opposite of the exit interview i'm actually more interested in the people who are staying at gebbin what mm -hmm. keeps them here and so we built like a whole structure around that um and we've done engage we do engagement surveys twice a year also i'm curious what are the what are the 
kind of either like structured formal ways or informal ways that you all have where you are getting that feedback on a regular basis? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, beyond the engagement survey, which we do every two years, so we're actually due for another one now at the end of this year. Um, we also have recently done a couple of pulse surveys. So the one survey that I mentioned where we were kind of getting feedback around returning to the office was the one. Um, we did another one, which is just, how is everybody feeling? You know, we just were kind of easing out of this pandemic. There's all this other social, you know, external um, challenges that are kind of hitting everybody all the time and it's constant. So it was really a our attempts to kind of get people to just you know hey tell us if you need help if there's anything that we can do to make your lives better um but then we also have what we call the people team and I, I referenced it right at the beginning and we do rely very heavily on them um as i said it's a kind of cross section of employees that have volunteered to be on this committee and you know through their own networks, through their own communities within the organization, they help us get a good sense of what people are saying at the water cooler. It's a little bit more difficult now because we do have this hybrid setup where people are half remote, half in the office. But these are trusted people who have got the credibility, who come from a place of truth, who are honest, humble, able to, you know, in a respectful way, ask folks for input and feedback and also help us get the message back out there around stuff that we have done because often the message doesn't always get back to employees um and also i would say that you know one of the pieces of feedback we got at the end of 2020 was that we give you all this feedback but nothing ever happens and so we wanted to be really deliberate certainly in this last year because there was just this kind of fragmented setup with this hybrid um you know, operating model to make sure that we were yeah. a lot more deliberate in terms of sharing some of the stuff that we had implemented. Yeah. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and then I want to go. I think we have a couple questions in the chat. So just a reminder for people who are watching us, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I'll try and we'll do like a rapid fire or something. I'll try and get to them. But um, one question for you, you know, as, as we think about the last few years, there's so much going on between the pandemic and and natural disasters and politics and race and you know international crises and now we've got you know hurricanes and and all kinds of just things that are taking a toll on our employees and all of our employees are experiencing these each of these situations different based on you know kind of their perspective i read an article recently that said we're having a nationwide anxiety like a collective nationwide anxiety disorder um how do you think, you know, as a conscious company, we're trying to be aware of like, how do we meet our people where they are? Um, how do you think companies, or what have you done at FreshPad, or what have you seen in other companies where they're really supporting their employees from a mental health standpoint, or, you know, if they're facing difficulties due to those external circumstances? So it's not necessarily like caused by their job. It's not necessarily directly tied to their job, but I think the reality, as we all know, it's certainly impacting their job. How do you navigate that as a, as a company? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with leaders. It starts with leadership, but it starts with, I think leaders recognizing that, you know, and it was in the introduction, we're a radically human organization. We are bringing our best selves to work. People don't come here to make a mess. They come here to really do the best that they can in the time that they're here. And so to the extent that we can support them and ease the burden, see how we can put them in contact with resources, give them access to resources. We will do that. We will go above and beyond. Um, but there is a recognition that that starts with the leader because that's typically who the employee will go to. They'll come to HR, of course, um, but they usually come through their manager. And so the first is just to create an awareness amongst our leadership team and specifically supervisors at middle management level that you also have a responsibility to one spot that you know, spot the issue, right? When somebody needs help, they might not be able to articulate it. They might not even know that they need help, but one is just to create that level of awareness. Um, and then secondly, once you do know that somebody needs help is to know how to help them, either you know, direct them to HR, provide them access to um, some of our partners, our EAP program, the resources that are available for employees. Um, so that's the first thing. The second is obviously, you know, we are in a, a wonderful position where we can partner with a number of different organizations. Um, from an insurance and health insurance point of view, we've started to roll out some wellness initiatives that I guess provide a little bit more um, guidance to employees around what's possible. And what we did is we selected a month every 
every month um, throughout this year dedicated to a specific to topic. So there was one on emotional wellness, there was one on nutritional wellness and health, there was one on financial wellness. Um, and each month we provided them with some resources, access to data, and then also just had guest speakers in here. What we also did is we extended it not just to the employees, but to their family. So for instance, when we had somebody come through and just provide some guidance on, you know, what they could do with their finances, especially since we're giving everybody equity, not everybody Absolutely. knows about the stock market. Um, yeah, not everybody yeah. knows about how to kind of think through the wealth that comes out and what to do with that. And so we invited spouses and family members in to kind of take part in some of those discussions. Um, and then just two other things that we did was we've, we've got a concierge service. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm chuckling because, I, you know, the concierge, you think of like a hotel, like there's this person that welcomes you at the door, welcome on in, how can I help you? We have that and um, we, we initially put that person in place because we had a bunch of folks from Texas that were up here to try and learn and train on our existing equipment. And of course, these people don't know Pennsylvania, they have no idea where to go to, who to go to, where to get my laundry done. They're away from their families for an extended period of time. And so if there was any way that we could take the burden off silly little things like, where can I go to cash a check? Where is the closest bank? How can I get my dry cleaning done? That request was given to this concierge, paid for by the company, and they would take care of it. And it's just one less thing to think about. And I guess in this kind of environment, to your point, Heather, where there's so much kind of being thrown at our employee base, if you can take away the small little things that, you know, can, that mean a lot. Um, it's just one more way to kind of help them navigate this really tr tricky space that we're in. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, there are a whole bunch of other examples that I can give you where we've kind of done stuff, I guess, that wasn't really normal, that isn't typical of an employer. Um, but I think the expectation, quite frankly, from employers now is that you are understanding the environment that we're operating in. And it isn't just, hey, you come to work for us and you go. It's it's kind of meeting them where they are, as we've kind of spoken about. Yeah. And that, you know, there's the piece of like, it's it's sort of the right thing to do if we really want to invest in our people. But then from a business standpoint, I have to imagine that that's also helping support your your ability to recruit and retain, which is super important in this job market. 100%. I mean, I think we've seen the most value um, in terms of taking this approach because so many of our employees are, are ambassadors of the company. And so when they leave here, word of mouth, you know, it, it gets out there that Fresh Pit takes its employees very seriously. We do right by our employees. We do the right thing. Um, and so many of our new employees are through referrals. And we've seen it also show up in terms of the reduction in turnover. Um, there's a, it's a very community-based organization. And we have a number of family members here as well, which isn't typical, right? You know, you, tr you try and keep levels and degrees of separation, but a lot of family members um, are working, obviously, in different parts of the organization, but it certainly strengthens the bond across the business. Yeah, I bet. We do have a question um, from Brandy. And just a reminder, if, if anyone has questions, there's a little Q&A feature at the bottom, so feel free to drop them in. But Brandy asked a question about um, what do you do specifically to foster diverse recruiting? I know you had mentioned, you know, the power of having diverse teams. Yeah. How are you focusing on diverse recruiting? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think, well, firstly, I mean, we don't have quotas. We would never want to go that, that path. But there is definitely something to be said around creating an awareness of the diverse mix of your team. And for us, diversity comes in so many different shapes and sizes. Obviously, there's you know the the characteristics that we're all very familiar with, but also diversity of thought, diversity of you know background and experience. And certainly, in an organisation like ours that is growing um, at such a rate, we take all of that really, really seriously. Um, we have a very um, large Hispanic community here in Bethlehem, and so we are certainly trying to make sure that the environment that we create certainly welcomes. Um, the Spanish speaking, you know, folks who kind of join our organization, we certainly try to recruit leaders that are able to speak Spanish, our signage, our communication is um, set up such that, you know, we are inclusive and, and make sure that this is an environment where people are able to work and thrive. Um, from a recruitment point of view, obviously, you know, we try and reduce our dependence on agencies um, because there's the cost that comes with that. <laughs> 
Um, but you know, to the extent that you can really cast your net out and make sure that the diversity that you have within reflects the diverse community that you are based in, that for us is, a, is the best litmus test, right? So is this reflective of the community that we are operating in? And if not, let's make sure that we're taking every step to, to have a diverse slate of candidates. And uh, if needs be, then work with agencies to, to pull in a good mix of talent. So I hope that answers your question, Brandy. <laughs> One question from um, Mary. It, you had mentioned that, that Freshman is a, a flat organization. So in a relatively flat organization, how do you think about offering professional development when there may not be as many promotional opportunities available? Or how do you balance the flat organization with people's desire to be to be growing in their career? What does that look like? Yeah, it's a tough one. I so recognize the challenge. I mean, you know, you typically think about growth as in the vertical movement up the hierarchy and that's kind of it comes to life in org design um but to the extent that you can grow jobs and that then shows up in compensation because i guess that's the second part of the equation if you're going to increase my scope make sure that you're paying me and rewarding me for my contribution to the organization that has definitely been the approach that we've taken um, we certainly want to be able to differentiate also in terms of potential, and that's where kind of leadership promotions certainly come to life. But I think we have so many opportunities within this organization and the ability to be agile and not be so rigid and bound by structure has enabled us to really provide development and growth. And then a perfect example is, you know, we've, we've recently launched um, an ERP, <laughs> which in itself is quite a challenge. I mean, it, it literally is the backbone of our organization, but anybody who's been through a transformational project like that knows that it takes an army and then some to implement this ERP system and get it anchored. And that means that you are pulling on resources from every part of the business, resources that you just don't have. And everybody's doing that plus some. But what we did do is try and, you know, almost pull folks out of their natural jobs and say, hey, we're going to second you to this project. It's a wonderful growth opportunity. Coming out of this, you're going to get exposure to different parts of the business. You've got folks from marketing doing stuff in logistics out in the plant that they wouldn't naturally and typically have done in their normal space of work. So it's really trying to be creative around some of the projects that you are deploying people to. Um, and then giving them an opportunity to also kind of raise their hand and say, hey, I'm interested in that. But with that, obviously, there is an assumption that, you know, there is going to be some growth development and it will also show up in compensation. And that's, I guess, the second part of that um, equation. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk real quick about uh, compensation again. We touched on this a little bit, but, you know, over the last couple of years, I think anyone who's in a hiring role has seen how salaries are just escalating so quickly. Um, talk a little bit about how you think about like the total compensation package between like yeah. salary and benefits or bonuses, or yeah. how do you how do you think about that as a, a total piece to create these win-win situations, but also recognizing that if someone's, you know, talking to you, they're, they're potentially also talking to another company that is offering a, a high salary. How do you navigate that? challenge yeah yeah i mean again i think it is a tough one and and it's it's a competitive market out there right it's a free market so people are obviously going to be weighing up their options when you join a company um we have tried not to just compete on salary right i mean i think that lends itself to this kind of escalation and um you know eventually it kind of gets out of control so the part that we've leaned into is the benefits part um, and we made some significant changes actually at the top of last year for us um, because we kind of had your standard offering of PTO and, you know, time off. But what we did is we actually flipped it around and kind of gave employees the benefit of the doubt. And what I mean by that is on the PTO side, taking time off or taking vacation, we front loaded our vacation and we said, here you go, here's an allotment of time off for you to do with what you will. We're not asking you to kind of accrue it over time. Every year, you're going to get a new bucket of time off. Um, and it exceeds what you would typically get in the market. Um, but this is recognizing that you too, you know, need to do stuff that fulfills you outside of the work environment. And that's just one example. Um, equity, obviously, is a very 
big component of our total compensation. And we've been really fortunate in the sense that we've been able to give employees and they've been able to see their wealth grow over time. I mean, we've also got a very high number of employees that were here from the original founding group. And they themselves have been able to kind of see the true value um, of you know, the stock kind of and the, the performance over time. And that is communicated to new employees. And of course, that becomes a, a fantastic tool for retention. Um, and then some other kind of creative benefits that we've added um, beyond kind of personal time off, uh, you know, we've just added a parental leave policy in where, you know, we're, we're certainly giving folks time off to take care of um, newborns, um, both dads and moms. Um, and then, uh, you know, pet insurance, uh, we have very competitive pet insurance policies, we offer free food in our kitchens, tuition reimbursement, we've just layered in um, recently. We're looking at some additional uh, tuition programs for families still to come. We're just kind of working through some of the numbers there, but we don't want it to just be about base comp because there's so much more, I think, that employees are expecting. And to the extent that we can meet some of those needs, um, we're kind of looking into a whole bunch of different avenues. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing all those examples. That's so helpful. I have one last very fun question, and then we'll turn it back over to the CCI team. So you are a pet friendly company. Yeah. How many pets do you have in your New Jersey office at, at any given time? <laughs> Um, wow. I mean, so Wednesdays is typically when most folks are in. That's kind of, I guess, the middle of the week. And most people do bring their pets in. We've got this wonderful central space in the office where it's, I guess, it's turned into a little bit of a dog park. I mean, we've got just That's under amazing. 100 employees in our New Jersey office. I would say the, the highest number of pets I've seen running around, maybe 10 between eight and 10 oh. dogs. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's um, a lot of dogs. Though, like, it, is awesome. a lot. Awesome. it is a lot. Yeah. 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 We wouldn't do that here in our, our manufacturing facility, obviously, because we're, you know, a, a food based environment. So we don't allow that here. But in New Jersey, yeah. 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 It's wonderful. Great. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. Um, and then I think with that, we're going to turn it back over to Queenie and the CCI team. <laughs> That was really fun and I really enjoyed listening to such a great conversation and how you really exemplify um, how you're a people first and values driven organization. So I appreciate the authenticity of your stories and how the team is still on its journey of what is right for your employees as it is really just ever evolving um, in this current market. So the care and the focus of your talent is um, and how you do care for them is very inspirational. So thank you for those responses, Heather, for those great questions. Um, and really, hopefully, it, it, you know, it's it's inspiring to our listeners here on how you're navigating and managing that um, with a values driven focus still, you know, uh, top of mind. So appreciate your time, energy and leadership. Um, also, a big thanks to the audience uh, for joining us today, today and for your great questions as well um, to help the CCI team to continue to improve and provide valuable programming. Please fill out the brief survey that's in the chat. That. Um, it'll take you about 20 to 30 seconds. And if you'd like to learn more about the Conscious Capitalism Movement, the organization, please visit uh, www.consciouscapitalism.org. Um, you will also find ways to learn more, get involved, and engage with other conscious business leaders like Heather, like Tempe, um, through our senior leader network, our local chapters in your local regions, and learn about more upcoming programming and events. So Tempe, Heather and everyone joining us today, wishing you all a wonderful rest of your week. And thank you again for a great conversation. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.